Well, there are two things which are rare in the Supreme Court of India. One is injustice being meted out. And the second is presence of women judges in the benches of the top court of the country. Well, the ninth woman judge of the Supreme Court of India was also the first woman chief justice of the Telangana High Court. We are talking about Justice Hima Kohli. Justice Kohli has not only broken and shattered glass ceilings for women lawyers in the legal profession, but also given them all a hope that if you work hard, you could reach the zenith of the legal profession. She is known for not mincing her words in the court of law. She is known for her uprightness and she is known for being a disciplinarian on the bench. Thank you so much, Justice Kohli, for Thank being with us in the Bar and Benches interview series. Ma'am, um, you had once shared that you had started your legal journey from um, the dicky of your car. Yeah. Um, if you could just, you know, go back and recollect those early days um, of your profession, how did it all start? So it started with uh, my family thinking that after having done my history honours and my MA history, perhaps uh, I was cut out to do something in the civil services and take the UPSC exams or perhaps go the academic way like my maternal side of the family is all professors and lecturers. And that was the done thing, so to say, in 80s, safe, secure and well sorted. Um, it didn't appeal to me. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't know what to do because there was nobody who had ever done law or had any guidance on that uh, in that background. So I initially thought maybe I should try my hand at civil services. The college I come from, most of my contemporaries were busy preparing for their exams, entrances and all of that. So I got swept. I thought, all right, now I need a library card because without that, how do I access my books? I was out of MA, so the campus law center was next to the uh, arts faculty. So happily trotted in, filled up the form and decided to go the legal way, but with the mind that maybe I'll do, take the UPSC. And when I went into law, I found it very interesting, very different, something which was not known, but had a, a, developed a liking for it. And uh, by then, my dad, we come from a business family, had that thing of, you know, nothing like civil services. Look at the way the bureaucrats function. It is such a matter of pride and pleasure. So I did tell him, look, uh, I will try my preliminaries once and then if I do make it, it will just to tell you I can do it, but I don't promise to go that way. So probably they took it with a pinch of salt and said, let her do it and we'll take a call closer to time. And I cleared my preliminaries. So they were pretty much confident that the mains will be the next step. And that's when I dug my heels in. And I said, if I happen to get through the mains, actually, I'll have no way to get back out of the system. So I said, nothing doing. I wanted to tell you I can do it this much and no more. I want to do law. And I continued with it. And my mum, an avid reader of Earl Stanley Gardner and all those American novels with regard to court practice and all of that was pretty much supportive, not really knowing the ground realities of an Indian law court. But she was very supportive and said, if she wants to do law, I don't see any harm. Let her continue and we'll take a call closer to time. And I landed up by default uh, into practice. And the best part was, and that is where you said coming, uh, running your office from the boot of your car. There was no backup. I knew nobody in the legal system. My parents uh, didn't know anybody who was a lawyer. Um, it was a taboo to go to courts. At that time, the societies didn't work like that. They would think it was the worst thing that you had to land up in court. So who knew a lawyer? So with a reference, I went to Justice Sunanda Bandare's chamber where she was just being elevated. Her name was Sru and she was going to the Delhi High Court as a judge soon and uh, got that entry point, which was a big thing. In those days, getting an entry point, and I think to a large extent even today, in a good chamber, is a bit big deal. If you manage to get through there, then you kind of find your space and place and make a, take a call further. I got it. I worked a couple of months and decided to move on to the High Court, which by now I think most of us know that I joined Justice Vaikis Sabarwal's chamber, where there was a lot of work. But the challenge came when I came on my own in early 90s after Justice Vijendra Jain got elevated as a judge of the High Court, my third and the last senior I worked with. And I realized that now there was no chamber to work from. There was no office space, which I had. I had almost same time lost my father. So there was a, you know, uh, up and down on the home front too. We were 
dealing with how the business had to be shut down or closed and all of it between me, my sister and my mother, we were th three women. And uh, knowing that there were clients who were uh, going to be scarce initially because all the practice had gone. You were working with a senior. When briefs go back, the people come to the senior. They don't come to you unless they develop that kind of confidence. So with a handful of briefs, but the, the desire to make your mark. And uh, that was an inspiration that came from uh, the way my seniors worked, I think. And I thought that it is time for me to set up an office and I didn't know where. So either you had to be in a lobby or a lounge of the, of the court or there was a ladies bar room which was not a place where you could actually sit and have a conference with any sort except maybe uh, have a little sh um, uh, what locker to put your gown in. One right. didn't even have anywhere to place your gown or your diary for the day. So managed to get a locker. Uh, forget about getting a chamber because I had think I had applied by the time I discovered you were to apply for a chamber. I had already three years were passed. Nobody told us. We didn't know. And by the time the chamber actually materialized, I was on the eve of getting elevated. So I really didn't use it. But I uh, thought that the car is a good comfort space because luckily we, my dad had given me one, a vehicle which uh, worked for me. So the dickie had a uh, a particular basta with all the briefs and another one with all the formats of process fees and inspection forms and what have you and all the basic stationery. That's how I took off and slowly built a little office at home, made a chamber, started buying books. They were expensive. Nothing was, came cheap, but we thought that, you know, which are the ones you need the most, the basic ones, the local laws, the constitution, the statutes which are necessary, the bear acts. And slowly built it up. That's how it was. But I, I my personal take is that uh, it might have also worked out in the bo uh, boot of the car because there was no Wi-Fi. Because <laughs> if you had to have, you know, the Wi-Fi in you. are right. Then, then that would have been a tough call. With that time, we didn't have mobiles. And the time we acquired one, I still haven't forgotten in late 90s. It was like a heavyweight thing, like a door, you know, dumbbell. <laughs> if you carried it in your purse, you couldn't lift your purse. It was that heavy. We didn't have those facilities and luckily we didn't need them at that time. And now we can't do without them. Yeah. This is Kohli, you were the first woman Chief Justice of Telangana High Court. Um, how was your shift from north to south? And were you able to bring any notable changes during your tenure as the Chief Justice of that particular High Court? It was a very enriching experience. Considering the fact that I'm born and brought up in Delhi and hadn't seen any other part at that length except for holidays. Going to Hyderabad was a beautiful exposure to the culture, to the roots of that part of the um, country, um, the warmth that the people emulated, the kind of extra efforts they made to make me feel comfortable. I really was grateful for all of that. I didn't expect it because it was an all uh, men court. Okay. There were no women except one, uh, Justice Sri Devi who had um, come from UP and was on uh, transfer to Telangana. Uh, we were um, in peak COVID times. Things were very rough. I had taken oath in January 21, uh, which was the time when COVID was on. And I demitted office from there when I came to Supreme Court in August. So there was that much of a window. But I'm glad to say that uh, I think that I, I was able to do things to make that court go forward. One of the most important things I found was in that court, for some reason, all matters that were adjourned weren't dated. So if there was a matter that was listed, there was no next date of hearing, which came to me as a real surprise, having come from a court like Delhi, uh, where everything which was adjourned was always dated to come back on the next day. Uh, there was a little resistance I did um, uh, receive from my colleagues, but they were very supportive by and large. I did explain to them that it was a cause of great concern for litigants who didn't know where they were heading. Matters kept getting adjourned with no date because they didn't know what the next date was. And it was also causing corruption in the registry because they could probably play around in which matters were to be listed and which one, which was not the done thing. So without an exception, uh, I had a lot of full court meetings which are all virtual. They worked well and bounced it off colleagues and said, won't bother you, just that the court master will fix a date. You don't need to bother about the calendar. They will run it for you. They agreed. Thankfully, after that, all matters in that court were never went back from court without a date. That was something I thought that was imperative for the comfort of a litigant. 
and a lawyer who knew which way he was to go. The second thing I, I was able to push through, and that was at that time the Chief Justice was Justice Ramana. It was hanging in the, uh, in the um, I think for quite a while, because after the um, unified AP split into Telangana and Andhra, the strength of the judges in Telangana were only about um, uh, 24 odd. And what we were looking at was humongous matters that had come to the Telangana High Court on the splitting of the litigation. It was pending for long and it was pushed and I made a request to expedite it. We got a strength of 42, so virtually doubled the strength of judges in that court in that duration. I was able to push in uh, as uh, heading the collegium 20 names of judges, both from the bar as also those from the district court. And almost all came through, some while I was uh, still there, others much later, but they came through. So the strength went up from 14 straight to plus 20, which was a big thing for handling benches. You couldn't make division benches, you couldn't have single judges working. Okay. So we were doubling, we were sitting in DBs and doing single, including me, because that was the only way we could have coped with uh, matters. Also during peak COVID, we did virtual meetings and I was, we were able to designate 27 senior advocates. That was also a good achievement because people were raring to get all through VC. All through VC. The entire interview process was through VC. Our core committee met in VC. We never met physically and we were able to do that. So I thought there were good things to be done in that court that worked. This is Kohli, when you were elevated to the Supreme Court of India, yeah. there were only a handful of women judges in the top court. True. And now as you demit office, the number has only reduced. So how do you think uh, there could be more women judges in the top court? Um, is, is the problem something else that than, than just collegium recommendations and passing through etc? To my mind the root problem would be and that would be for my generation and I hope it doesn't happen in the future. Uh, when you say just a few women, there was a situation where there was no woman, there was a situation where there was one woman, symbolic in the true sense of Absolutely. the word. So the fact that they were at one point of time when Justice Indra Banerjee was there before us, we were, and we joined three of us, um, Justice Nagaratna, Justice Bela Trivedi, we were four, it was a big deal. There was never ever any um, strength of that kind in that court. And much credit goes to the collegium at that time headed by Justice Ramana, who were able to, who agreed that out of nine there should be three women. But at the end of the day, Debayal, unless there is a pool to select from, and when I say a pool, there are two sets of pools we all know, those within the system. One that is from the lawyers and the other judicial officers. We have, you're talking of the Supreme Court, I'll add to it to the high courts also. Some state high courts have that problem. While we have a large number of women who fortunately are in the judicial uh, judiciary from coming from district courts, there are very few in other states and I'm not talking of prime courts like Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Calcutta and others. The other states where there were very few practitioners who were serious. So the pool would shrink when it come, came to advocates and selection from there. Yeah. I faced it in Telangana. Thankfully, I was able to select at least two or three of them, which was a big deal and designate the first woman senior advocate in that court. But if the pool is small, then the, uh, so the selection is also limited to that number. Okay. Similarly, in the Supreme Court, and that's, that's how it pl plays in the collegium there, if the pool is small to select from, Either they will be selecting it only as chief justices of state high courts, which are limited, or go down the line and pick up puny judges, which has been the trend recently, and plenty puny judges, not just women, but men have also been picked up from down below and brought up. So for the sake of getting more women, if they go down the collegium, I see no harm up to a point. But maybe perhaps not overlooking the chief justice who through the dint of hard work, I mean a woman chief justice, has made it to the top and should remain in the zone of consideration unless there are reasons to rule her out. Of course. That is what I would say. So the, the problem would lie in enlarging the pool. So the more the women are mainstreamed, the more they are in active litigation practice when it comes to practitioners, the more the larger the pool is for selection and easier it is to pick up for so the village. the next two decades look hopeful. Brighter. We have uh, in, the judicial, in the judiciary subordinate courts where we have more than 50% women, um, who are um, judges and coming in at very young. So when they say cut them run, young, they are really being caught young and they are uh, coming up at younger ages instead of just the last four or five years of uh, left before they end up in the high court. So that gives them a greater chance to contribute in every which way with their experience in the higher judiciary. So if that happens, 
then the same thing has a ripple effect upwards right. to the Supreme Court. And that is how it should be. So I'm looking at a brighter future and a better one. And on the lighter side, I did say um, that uh, the last day at work when the Honorable the Chief Justice and the Collegium had met up for something else which we were not aware of, and we were sitting in the lounge, and I did mention when Chief came in that I think you all got delayed because you were look at, looking at, and I hoped looking at a woman to replace me, and I would be the happiest. Of course, it was um, meant to be a joke, but I hope it happens, and I'll be more than happy to see another woman occupying that okay. seat. Uh, Ma'am, as a um, woman judge of the Supreme Court of India, yeah, um, did you ever feel any kind of gendered bias um, from your colleagues um, from the bar in this particular, you know, duration of journey in the Supreme Court of India? And uh, do you think such kind of bias has completely departed from the apex court, even if ever it existed there? Shall we make it a bit larger, Devan, by saying that uh, when it comes to feeling um, the um, the gender angle that uh, that uh, from the high courts too, then that's how we go up the thing. So we're not talking of three years. Maybe we are talking for a window of 20 years, oh. right? When you enter the system. So initially, one does find that uh, sometimes, and I'm not generalizing because we, I've had all kind of supportive men colleagues who have uh, helped me in my journey and others who have not helped me and kept a fine distance, uh, that uh, there is, um, uh, and that not just colleagues but also lawyers, that you have to work that extra hard to prove your point, to prove yourself as serious, to be taken as seriously as you think you should be taken. Uh, much lies in your own hand also because it is how you conduct yourself. If you are going to be frivolous or you are going to be light, well, the other person will perhaps reciprocate in the same way. It's, uh, it's your call. But then again, there are people who would think that uh, maybe, you know, as a woman, give a lighter work, give a lighter work, lighter jurisdictions, stuff like that, which would be not so heavy, maybe not really constitutional issues or not maybe get them so much into full, co uh, into, uh, full benches, in high courts, full benches, three judges benches, compared to men, which I think is not fair, which Has shouldn't be. Uh, well, speaking for myself, I think except for one, uh, two full benches, I never got to sit in that in so many years and more than two. Um, one was a five judges one where there was a issue relating to IPR which was uh, which had to be resolved. So I was there perhaps because we had delivered a judgment on which I was part of it which needed to be clarified and one more perhaps but not more than that. So why not? I don't see that if you are a lawyer and you've done it all or you've been a you've seen it all then you're equally competent to handle it when you're a judge there's nothing wrong with asking to be given heavier benches, uh, benches with heavier work, with constitutional issues to be thrashed out. It's happening now, I'm seeing and I'm happily seeing it in the high courts. So uh, the other biases would be, uh, like for example, if there is a official function in the courts and there are plenty of it that we have to conduct and hold. So who would be the go-to person for the menu? A lady judge. So why would it be a lady judge? Isn't that that men eat as much or uh, whatever variety they have vis-a-vis -a, -vis a woman? It should not be a woman judge. It should be a judge. Maybe a committee comprising of a male and a woman. But not that it would come on the shoulders of a woman because merely because she would know better about what's it to cook. I wouldn't. I shouldn't be made to feel like that. And if you make a point, they understand. Sometimes men don't understand. It comes to them naturally. Perhaps they have not been brought up in that manner of they accept it as a norm. I'm not blaming them, but somebody has to tell them. So if you're willing to tell them, then uh, sometimes you're willing to take cudgels also for what you stand for. And they respect you. But then you must command that respect. And that comes from you. Again, did it happen with you? A couple of times in the high court, yes. Um, some important committees, uh, I, the other said, vocalized it. Uh, there were several committees that we have in courts to run the courts. We are talking of Delhi High Court. Delhi High Court specifically. Uh, that was my large experience. I had a little, little lesser experience as Chief Justice there, but then there are different norms. So why would you not be part of important building maintenance committees or building construction committees that needed the input infrastructure and all that? Merely because you're a woman? No, you have your experience that you carry with you that should be put to use, that should be implemented. So it need not be women's committees as in women-centric committees, juveniles, mm, children, family courts. Why? 
Why can't it be purely IPR? It's happening now. It wasn't happening then. Or purely arbitrations. Or purely commercial matters. It should come as easily to you as to any male colleague. You have done that work in different uh, phases of your life as a lawyer. So those are things which once they're brought out, many don't want to bring it out. Others are reluctant. Some aren't. So it depends on how you are and how much you're willing to take on. No, at the risk of being called to, you know, uh, blame for ha hammering the point, but, you know, when you were approached for deciding the menu, how did you respond to it? I think I simply said we have a committee which is uh, meant to do this work. So let it be bounced off the committee. It comprises of both men and women so they can take a call on it. For everything there is a committee. So for this also there is a committee. That made the point. So it works and not that there was any resistance. We all agreed that there was a committee that had to do it and the committee would do a good job of it. And we had very, very, um, some of our colleagues who were such foodies that perhaps they would contribute much more than I would have perhaps to a menu. And it worked beautifully for them. And what about the Supreme Court of India? In the Supreme Court, uh, mm, I haven't felt that kind of uh, abrasion vis-a-vis uh, -vis my male colleagues. I'll be very honest. They've been more than respectful. They have been more than accommodate. They didn't need to accommodate. They have treated me equally. Uh, no holds on that. I would be the first one to admit that. And uh, I must credit them for all the support and uh, all the respect one got. Uh, I'm grateful. I got to sit in constitution benches, as you know. Honorable the Chief Justice of India was uh, made sure that more women are part of those constitution benches. So I can't complain on that uh, front again. Uh, it was. It, this is not a court which is uh, jurisdiction centric, as you know. So it's a mixed bag. So it's not as if some particular set of matters were constantly being thrown at you vis-a-vis right. -vis others. So I, I can't say that either. They were much more accepting. In fact, the three of us were really welcomed warmly by most of our colleagues. They were happy to see more uh, women around. And we carry our own experience on the bench, which they value. Um, Justice Kohli, the Kolkata rape and murder, murder case has somehow taken the country by storm. But it has also opened floodgates to discussions among the legal circles where women have come um, to the front and, you know, has admi have admitted facts that, you know, they were harassed by their male superior colleagues in their law firms, etc. Um, is it just those women, women with a very strong support system who can survive in such scenarios or we are talking about? And uh, how should such situations be tackled? What I'm asking you is that we know how that law firms work till very late. Yes, and, that's uh, right. Uh, you know, there is, a, there, there is a problem, there is an inhibition in part of the lady lawyers to speak about it because they need the briefs, they need the chamber that's to right. work with. That's right. So how do you deal in, with, with such a situation now? So Debra, it was a matter of chance that in Delhi uh, High Court, I was handing the, um, the ICC and uh, we came across such cases but not relating to women lawyers specifically because for them the forum was different. I'm sorry to say, but at that time when we were, I was part of the heading the ICC with the other colleagues, we discovered that there was no internal complaints committee set up by the Bar Council of Delhi, none. And complaints that came from women lawyers had to be directed there because we in our position were supposed to, our mandate was to handle it from within the court as in the staff versus staff and such like, but not the legal fraternity that had to go to the Bar Council of Delhi or India. We had held joint committee meetings. I remember heading them and calling them all on board to say, where are those systems and why are they not there? Where will a woman lawyer go if she is harassed either by her colleague or by a member of the um, working staff in a court or maybe even by a male judge if they had a complaint? depending on what kind of complaints because we did get a complaint from a woman lawyer and we were not to handle it but we found we couldn't have referred to her or her to anything to any particular forum that's when they woke up to actually to the male judge and uh, no in her case it was a, a colleague okay. uh, with whom she had a problem which was not our remit yeah so therefore we had to refer but we had to refer to somebody who could deal with it we couldn't just leave it in the air so while making arrangements we discovered this was not there reached out to the Bar Council of India, asked them because they are the appellate authority. They are not the first forum. Right. The, they can only deal with the appeals that come from the Bar. So if the Bar Council, people didn't even know that it is not the Bar Association. 
but the bar council of the state that is supposed to set it up that they didn't know that they had it had to be more women and what kind of constitution it had to have and that is why they buy and if you remember when i got an opportunity recently in supreme court in a matter um i did flag this issue and said that all iccs need to be revamped and drawn in accordance with the statute and how many are there and why are they not there and there were several questions that posed in that particular matter because i found that there was a complete vacuum if it can happen in a, a city state like delhi it could happen in all other state high courts without one even knowing where to send the woman to Absolutely. that those were problems they didn't know where to go to so therefore we requested that the courts set up their different their dashboards and create those spaces everywhere where they would know where to go to i was heading the gender sensitization committee in the high, in the supreme court yes. too so we enlarged that window we made sure that they they knew where to go what kind of complaint format so on so forth so that they don't need to have a physical interface and still get the complaint going these are things that need to be voiced and there are few very few as you said who are willing to come forward yeah. and those who do if they don't know where to go it will just die a natural death that's not the way but what is the way ahead even if after you lodge the complaint yes you know even if the complaint is dealt with uh, how does a woman feel secure working for those late hours in a chamber uh, yeah so one is late hours in the chamber one is late hours in a law firm and chambers also work late hours speaking for myself i do remember as a woman and we had law interns and researchers who would be working with us till late hours one would always find oneself worried about them and taking responsibility for their being able to reach home these days youngsters are so um forward looking they'll say it's okay ma'am we have a ola we booked a cab we are fine and one would say no we need to track you we need to know if you reached home because you are my responsibility many of them don't even belong to delhi they come from out of delhi to make a place for themselves it's tougher for them if there's no family there to track them or keep, take care of their security so women need to be vocal everybody can't be vocal i'm sorry there is some extent of misuse also of this provision sometimes which we have come across when we deal with complaints which in fact to my mind gives a bad name to the whole thing because then genuine cases suffer if these kind of some kind of frivolous cases come you come across which have other vested interests which are not to relate of with uh, sexual harassment it dilutes the cause so it's very important that uh, women must realize how important this tool is how to use it correctly one and not to hesitate they need that kind of encouragement in delhi high court when we had a, a woman making a complaint against her colleague i remember passing an order and directing as a committee not me alone as a committee directing that the high court provide her conveyance from the court premises to the closest metro on the house so that she could reach her home safely that negotiating the last mile was difficult for her because metro stations and bus stations at night are equally lonely yeah. so we made sure that they were picked up from the court and dropped to that point so that they knew that they were safe and on to a public transport some things you have to do to go that extra mile to be able to give them that comfort that they've come to an institution that should be able to protect them and make sure that the first thing you do is they move out of that particular space and are placed somewhere else they are not in that department they don't need to see that man ever and to direct that he should be away maybe 100 meters or so from wherever she is keep that distance we passed orders like that on the in the committee so it is for that particular internal complaints committee to work it out and be powerful enough to implement it right um this is cold do you think you know, this question actually assumes importance in this current scenario but do you think the allocation of cases in the supreme court on the basis of subject matter to judges can be improved um we know you know and i know and those in the legal profession know that ultimately it is a call of honorable the chief justice of india because he is the master of the roster and whatever comes our way is assigned to us there is there's no denying it that's how it works so the question that you're posing is perhaps posed to the uh, head of the institution in a manner of speaking um there are times when you find that uh, maybe it could be easier if one jurisdiction is equally divided one one block of jurisdiction in, in not just kept in in a couple of courts maybe 3 4 so that there is an even balance sometimes in how matters are de dealt with and tackled that can help uh we in this court find that and that has been our experience that everything is thrown your way 
when you're holding a particular jurisdiction, when you're assigned, shall I say, a particular jurisdiction. So you are doing a bail matter, then the next matter is a tax matter, the third is a GST, the fourth is a land acquisition, and the fifth is a specific performance, and the seventh is a, uh, sixth is a family court dispute. It's a mixed bag. But uh, if that is rotated more often, I think that would address an issue instead of perhaps six monthly. So that can be, uh, you could get a better flavor of how courts handle particular jurisdictions as against keeping it um, for a whole tenure of six months and sometimes even beyond it. So one would, perhaps some benches would just end up doing some um, routine civil matters with some MACT or land, land acquisition thrown in, which are routine. And I'm not making small of those matters. Those are matters that of, of moment that um, persons who are aggrieved need relief for. I'm not making small of it, but it certainly would help if it was an even mix instead of um, specific jurisdictions. And if there are specific jurisdictions, the timeline should be limited. It should be for six months. It should be for shorter durations so that the uh, fresher winds come in and blow in. No, um, also, my question also stemmed from this fact that um, in the recent past, while you were a part of yes. the top court, some politically sensitive cases were being assigned to some particular benches which were, what, what should we say, not relief oriented. Um, some litigants, Justice Kohli, went to the extent of even withdrawing their cases from the top court when they came to know that this particular case is before a particular judge. Um, is there a need for introspection into this aspect? The introspection would be at one level of um, the person is in whose hand it is to assign those matters and the other level is of those who are dealing with the matters. Uh, fortunately, there has been and in the recent past you will, um, it will bear me out, there has been introspection and you've got new winds blowing and you've noticed that it has been constantly been said that this is not the way to go when we talk of bail, we are talking of freedom, personal liberty. Right. Uh, the PMLAs and UPAs alone can't be the guiding factor that the basic tenets of uh, bail remain the virtually the same barring a few aspects which are specialized because of those particular statutes that need to be kept in mind and um, I'm happy for it and I'm glad that uh, perhaps it's a part of our introspection. Some of us are made that way, others aren't. You know that uh, not just these important matters, uh, the bend of mind of particular judges is by and large known to the bench, uh, to, the, uh, to the bar, uh, having appeared so frequently in particular courts. Many times one would, uh, as a lawyer, I remember saying, okay, but that is a pro-landlord bench and you're wary if you're pairing as a tenant. Have you ever withdrawn a case from a bench? No, maybe just uh, decided to defer it in the uh, sheer prudence as a lawyer in the interest of my client maybe the and the request case. for a date hoping and that would happen perhaps and we've experienced it as judges invariably before the summer vacation if you had a, bear, a roster which the other person was not happy with your view they would say you know please adjourn it and you know, we'll take it up piano no hurry july if you don't mind all kind of excuses you knew and many times perhaps a bar knew where we are going before we knew as <laughs> what our rosters were on the lighter side so then we would play that tactic that's also part of uh, being a lawyer isn't it right um the apex court um, has been criticized as you said the winds of change ha has blown but has been criticized for not following its own verdicts where bail is the rule, jail is the exception, the principle was laid down. Recently, there have been uh, decisions by the top court, whether it be in the Arvind Kejriwal case or the Manish Sisodia case. Uh, these politically sensitive cases where such rules na have now been upheld. But previously, these similar cases were turned down. Um, I, my question is, do, do draconian bail provisions in PMLA or you know UAPA act as a deterrent in implementing this basic principle in the court of law or there is a need to reconsider these draconian bail provisions in these laws? The need to reconsider should come from the legislature. I would not be one to speak about it because it is their domain and they are the ones who legislate. And you are also aware of the fact that many times if the courts interpret it in a particular manner, the legislature does turn around and amend or act. Hmm to overcome a judgment too. That has happened sometimes, a judgment which may be not acceptable to them and that is their prerogative since they are the elected uh, body of uh, coming from the public. But come, when it comes to courts, uh, one must uh, always keep in mind that the uh, ultimately the fundamental principle of freedom and right to liberty uh, cannot be compromised, should not be compromised. 
in certain certain circumstances because these as you said are draconian laws they have to be interpreted strictly but strictly doesn't mean only in favor of the um, enforcement directorate or the CBI strictly means on both sides strictly so that would mean drawing a, a path through which you find if there is default on the part of the agency find them equally at fault and take it further and take it to the root of um, personal independence and a right to liberty over everything else those are the basic tenets that we we in our constitution live breathe and uh, swear by so any dilution on that uh, should be um, should be prob probably um, be uh, brought down to the as much extent as is possible to make sure that these tenants are not compromised in any which way the message should be that yes bail is the rule in specific statutes unless the role attributed is such unless the the trial is uh, not going on then the court must look at the other way and see why the personal liberty of that particular individual should be compromised any further justice kohli you became a household name during the patanjali case proceedings mm -hmm. Um, why I'm saying that is because perhaps it was after a very long time that the top court did not mince words or hesitate to pull up a public personality for probably an act of contempt. Of course, they were let off at a later date after an apology, etc. But do you think such a way of handling cases in the top court have become rare? And why is it so? And when I actually said that it was after a long time that this happened, this shows that you know, even the media has been watching that this kind of an action has not come from the top court very often. And so part of the question is answered by you by saying yes it is rare, it doesn't happen that often. But let's not forget that uh, contempt is uh, a jurisdiction that we do use carefully. Ordinarily it is not meant to prove a point or to show that, uh, uh, that the, the court is so superior to others that it can call the shots, it's never the case. It is a case of when we talk of majesty of law we are actually talking of the role of a court and its acceptance and its respect in the eyes of the public. The whole idea of contempt is to make sure that the world, the public, the citizen knows that if there is an order passed by that court, it must be respected and taken to its logical conclusion. There cannot be any negotiation in that order. And if an order is not implemented, it brings down the majesty of the court. And I'm not talking of the judge. The judge just happens to be the person who is sitting and wearing the mantle of the court. So to my mind, that's a very important jurisdiction. It should be used sparingly, but when it is used, it should be taken to, unless there are reasons for not taking it to its logical conclusion. That a person apologizes and it is, it is a lip service, you can make out when you're sitting in court whether it is lip service or not. And if it is, why should you let the person off the hook? But at the same time, we, it is not that every contempt should be taken to the uh, farther end of sending persons to jail. That is not the purpose. That will also dilute the strength of contempt if we did it that often. The point is the person, person, personality, whoever it is, should know that nobody is above the law. And if nobody is above the law, then that should apply equally across the board, irrespective of faces, names or personalities. And if it can happen to, this, the, to a personality, then the last line, man in the queue should also know that if he violates an undertaking given to the court, there are consequences that follow. And there are serious consequences. Be, be it a tenant who has given an undertaking to the court that he'll vacate a premises within four, five or six months, or somebody else who has assured the court that he will pay up the other side on a settlement and decides to renege. That's where the contempt jurisdiction is exercised. You're talking of an important case like this because it came in public perception. We do have, and they're, they're, those are on-running cases, I won't take names. But if a person has arrived at a settlement before this, before the Apex Court and has not abided by it, it was uh, uh, my bench that sent him behind bars. So it is not as if contempt is not taken to its logical conclusion. We decided he deserved to go behind bars, and we did that. Once me as heading a bench another time, I do remember sitting with Honorable the CJI, and there was a matter where um, there was a, I think a, it was a builder and um, apartment owners disputes where the builder was not delivering and kept promising. We actually sent him behind bars because we thought he deserved that. And the moment he was, we would be willing to pay and give them the apartments, we were willing to bring him out 
we did that twice over thrice over so many times so those matters don't come in the limelight as much because people are not interested was it the super tech case yeah. one of them was that another one was also a, a contract with a foreign um, a, a buyer who uh, that person had to maybe spend some months behind bars because it was an ongoing contempt and the purpose was that he should abide by the undertaking so why would you give an undertaking to the court and why would the court not ensure that the undertaking is actually given effect to in letter and spirit that is a spirit of contempt. Um, Justice Kohli, um, perhaps in one of the most important judgments rendered by a constitution bench of the Supreme Court of India, you were in majority. But the Supreme Court ruled that um, LGBTQIA persons do not have the right to marry. Uh, do you think the Indian society in 2024 is still not ready to accept the plea for marriage equality? And secondly, uh, do you think the judgment that was delivered by the majority bench was also kind of powered by the societal considerations of acceptance of right to marriage for the LGBTQIA persons or not. So the fact that you're talking of 2024 would only mean less than one year since we delivered the judgment. That was sometime in October, to the best of my recollection, of 23. These things, and that is what we felt as a majority, must come first from the society. As judges, judgments relating to your cultural leanings and rootings can't be foisted on the public. It is they who should initiate it, enough for the legislator to wake up to it and legislate. And once they do it, that shows it's the will of the people. Should the court foist its will on the people? To me, the answer would always be no. The court must recognize it, which we did and said that there is something that the legislature must look at. But given the statutes that were being quoted to claim equality as right to marry, well, they were not tailored for that purpose. And that is what the majority view was. So we could not incorporate things which it was not tailored to deal with, to um, cater to. That was the, the statutes were entirely on a different format. One, I would be the first one to respect those relationships on my personal level. But when it comes to giving a judgment, respect them, give them regard. And we did in our judgment say that there are several things the state must do to give them that comfort. But then ultimately, who is to decide? The society, whether they want to recognize that relationship and give it that validity in law. And once they do it, why would the legislator not turn around and recognize it? It's their job as lawmakers to do it. And then it should come to the court to interpret. And not that it, come, it should come from the court and go downwards. That would not be the right way because then acceptance and resistance would be a big issue. But um, I think one of the um, prayers in the petition was not about um, the court directing the legislature to frame a law. It was about the court recognizing the fact that there is a right to marriage also for the LGBTQI persons. My question to you is, Justice Foley, why did you take a step back from that? We did because the, because the statutes that were being quoted to support the argument did not cater to those requirements. Simple as that in one line. They were not meant to cater to this situation. They were made in different circumstances. They were supposed to cater to a particular set of people, which did not include the set. So it could not be brought in and read in. Uh, recently, your verdict holding uh, that, you know, your judicial conscience did not permit the termination of a pregnancy um, was upheld by the CGI led bench. Of course, there was a dis dissenting judgment too. Uh, but it has been criticized widely as a step back for abortion law. Uh, how do you respond to that? So should we be case-centric in this, Debayan? And I would like to be case-centric now that the matter is over. Uh, that was a case where uh, the lady was not clear which way she was going. It was a case where um, our bench, which was constituted to hear the matter, had actually called in the lady, first virtually because we didn't want to disturb her, had a lot of interaction with her, called in the husband, so that we knew which way his wife wanted to go, spoke to him. Uh, there was a lot of vacillation in her mind. A woman who is pregnant goes through a lot of feelings and sentiments and emotions. It's not that she's going to be, feel the same all through. Sometimes she felt she's comfortable, other times she didn't. And that is why we wanted a specific uh, committee to go into it, which is the doctors. Uh, somehow the reports that came indicated, we, we had asked questions whether they abortion. And we initially did as a bench given order saying that please go ahead and do it. 
It was only when they came back with a second report and said that there was, a, the, by then the fetus had life, it was a living being. Then what about the right of the fetus came a question because that was a very last stage. The statute did not contemplate beyond 24 weeks. One has to keep in mind that's a statute that says not beyond 24 weeks. Circumstances had to be such and so extraordinary for us to ignore that and go forward for reasons which have also been stated in many judgments. There were no birth defects as well. There were no birth, birth defects. We, there was nothing that was that was so precarious that the life of the woman was endangered because that's what the report said. And by then we were very close to time. And that is why I said that my judicial conscience does not allow it because we had one has to balance the right of the uh, that living being in the body of the mother and the mother. Incidentally, just as an aside, matters over now. The baby was born. It's a bonny baby, and I did check later and find out what happened. We had given the option to the mother and the parents that they wanted to give the child to the state. The state would take the child and rear the child, or maybe give out the child in adoption, the parents did not opt for it. They kept the child and they're happily uh, bringing the child up. And, and they, they were the first, the mother was the first one to say that she did not want the child to go out. And it delighted me to know that we had a baby that was safe in a safe home with the parents and doing well for itself. This is matter centric. That is why I said you can't have a generalized statement. So, what is your answer to this entire about um, the, the you know the group of people I would avoid using the term yeah. the, the entire group of people who criticize the verdict as a step backwards for abortion law in India in the sense that does abortion law in India only means that when a woman says that I want to terminate a pregnancy, the termination should happen forthwith or there should be checks and balances? To my mind, there has to be checks and balances and that is why the statute has laid down the conditions. How can you ignore the act and the law of the land and just go ahead and take what is in your mind? You have to abide by it. Draw up exceptions. Those ex exceptions have been drawn up by Supreme Court in cases and we know what they are about the state of the mind of the woman, her circumstances, maybe somebody who has been raped, who is a minor, who doesn't know what's happened to her. There are so many situations we have contemplated and maybe they can be expanded, but one can't have a sweeping statement to say that there is, of course a woman must have a right over her body, that I'll be the first one to admit it. And there are cases where I as a judge in the High Court have passed such orders and we have permitted it without any hesitation. But it is case to case. You have to see what the mindset of that woman is and not of the husband. Uh, mind you, I'm not saying of her husband, of her in-laws, of her family, Absolutely. of the woman. She is the master of her body. But then when the child crosses that Rubicon, one has to be doubly cautious to see that there are some things to be bad. Exactly. Um, this is Kohli, do you think, um, you know, we, we are at an intersection where the new criminal laws have now come in place. Do you think, firstly, there was a need to overhaul the existing criminal laws and did we really achieve the object of uncolonizing, uncolonizing the justice system? And what are the practical difficulties, um, you know, which judges face when you have to deal with an entire set of new criminal laws? And we are well aware of the you know, amount of litigation that you know, criminal law has in the all, all courts across India. And Given the imminent uh, challenges to you know certain provisions and gaps the law has, or the legislations have to fill in, uh, does it feel like a complete you know Sisyphean task to achieve at this point of time? I won't call it Sisyphean for the simple reason. In Sisyphean, then it is a repetitive, never-ending, and no results born kind of a res um, consequence, and that is what the old ages of Sisyphus, the Greek god. I would say that it would be a big challenge for the judiciary and the lawyers because and the public prosecutors to first to unlearn some things and then to learn new things. It's not easy. Uh, the legislature has thrown an enactment at um, the courts which is going to be a, it is a work under progress in every which way. Many of the things that maybe they were part of it which was colonial needed to be dealt with but because it has completely been overhauled the, the comparisons of the old act and the new act and the common commonalities between them will take a lot of time for us to for it to settle. We'll have a we'll have spewed a lot of litigation that will ultimately land up in the Supreme Court for interpreting those enactments in the light of the precedents we've had based on the earlier law. So there, it is going to be a major challenge for which it is very important that all the judicial academies need to gear up the judges to understand, to learn, to unlearn, to upgrade themselves. 
all the public director of directorate of public prosecution which means the arms of the state need to upgrade themselves the police departments need to know because many of them don't know how it's working still on the ground they are still struggling there is a lot of overhaul that would be required undoubtedly but because it's a legislation that has been thrust at all of us we need to deal with it and so whether it's bnss or others i mean we are so used to spouting crpc and ip ipc that the tongue rolls when you have to say bnss so it takes time for all of us to learn and unro unlearn it fortunately one of the things that happened in bnss was which i think on my last day before demitting office we did was for those inmates who had spent one third instead of half of the time in jail where the case is in custody we were able to pass orders across the country for them to be released immediately by the public prosecutors approaching the courts and the state courts high courts and the state um, uh, judiciary taking note of it and releasing them because of the kind of uh, crowding in jails that has happened right. could see um, so many people in custody just waiting for their cases to but do you think we need to overhaul the entire maybe not completely maybe partly yes maybe partly to uh, maybe uh, focus perhaps to focus on those which are truly colonial, uh, colonial and not all of it but since it's been done wholesale so are we talking about amendments which should have been carried perhaps to make it easier as a starting point the the state executive felt otherwise they thought that we should start from a clean slate well intended perhaps but when it works out in courts in courts at all levels it's going to be a tough call for judge increases the burden it has to we let's not forget a simple enactment like the ni act the negotiable instruments act aren't we still struggling with the volume set as it is thrown up and that's just one act here it's the entire criminal jurisprudence that will go through the journal now coming to a very contentious issue of judges appointments uh, the system of judicial appointments has been widely criticized for the lack of transparency and nepotism etc uh, do you think there is a need for change and what is your view on the role of consulti judges in this entire process so the ban um, most of the public maybe even lawyers and others don't know that uh, a collegium has uh, one limb of opinions coming from what we call the consulti judges so who are the consulti judges say if i am uh, consulti judges are largely only in the supreme court and not in the high courts the consulti judges is a judge who is from a particular state high court and has the experience hands on of seeing the judges and the lawyers functioning in that court enough to know what kind of talent we have and what kind of talent pool is being tapped by the collegium to recommend the names of those judges to the supreme court right so when the collegium receives the recommendations from a state high court they invariably go to the send that particular set of names to the consulti judges take for my own example having been uh, in delhi high court as my parent court and telangana as a chief justice the uh, i would get those names that would come from telangana and delhi for my input on those particular individuals which would then go to the collegium and i would not be the only one whoever else is from that right. state high court that's the prerogative of the collegium whether they want to send it to all of them if there are too many or at least two of them and if there's nobody one of them depending those that input is also factored in by the collegium when they give their view and take a call on that candidate so that role i think is imperative of that consulti judge but again if that consulti judge is only one part of the process and not the entire part it's just his his or her input the collegium has to take an overall view to my mind uh, sometimes it is good to give reasons when you decide to appoint somebody but at other times when you give reasons you impinge on the privacy of that candidate seriously and somebody who has no say in the matter except that he has or she has agreed or given consent to be considered uh, lands up in a big mess because it's not he or she it's the whole family involved in an appointment because whoever goes in there are systems there are networks uh, faces a backlash for which he or she is helpless they have no answers to give because nobody asked them it's a view given by the court so i certainly think it's all very well to be transparent up to a point but there has to be a line drawn at some point where some things are left within the four walls of the collegium if instead of everything being coming out in public domain because it damages that candidate not because the collegium has to be more transparent but must must respect the privacy of that particular 
candidate who remains in that mainstream, whose name is dropped. Um, do you think there is any reform needed in the process of designating senior advocates in the Supreme Court, especially in this current scenario wherein um, we saw, I'm adding a little more to the background, we yeah. saw a number of names being cleared for senior advocates recommendation, um, which, you know, um, we also reported that some senior members of the bar had a meeting with the Chief Justice asking for reconsideration of the process. Right. What is your take on this entire process of senior advocates being designated in the Supreme Court? See, earlier the designation system in all courts was different. It was it would just go to the full court and uh, names were circulated and we would take a call and we would uh, vote. Mostly we would, would go by uh, voting and secret vote. It was not an open vote unless really the candidate was so good that everybody thought the, this particular person doesn't deserve to be put to vote. He or she deserves to be designated anyways. That was working. There were uh, then there were sometimes there were cliques for which lawyers resisted it and felt that there was no transparency. Names were dropped because some particular set of judges didn't like those names, and that's when the interface between a committee comprising of a representative from the bar, the president of the bar, one nominated member, and all that came along. Um, the role of the full court got diluted to that extent. Um, in the Supreme Court, it is now the committee that. Uh, as in other courts. It is the committee that interacts with a particular candidate and thereafter uh, gives its view uh, or sounds off and gives a list of shortlisted. Uh, I think the role of the full court should be a bit larger thereafter and, uh, in, uh, and in, in sheer deference, should it be that in sheer deference to the committee. We know that committees work very hard when they have to interview hundreds of lawyers. It's not easy. Their judicial time is eaten into. They have to deliver it, meeting hundreds of them together. Systems have been put in place so that if you know them, you're not asking stupid questions to them because you've seen them appearing before you, most of them. And where you haven't, I think it would be important for the members of the committee to consult those judges in whose jurisdictions they've been appearing. We used to do that in the High Court regularly. If I knew uh, some that I don't know this particular name, and a colleague, and he's a taxation specialist. And my colleagues who have been working in that particular jurisdiction have seen that person appear. I see no harm in my asking my colleagues, how is this person, how is she as a candidate, or how is he doing? What kind of a reputation does he have? It's not necessary we should know everybody because it's such a, such a big bar. So that input is very important. Coming from another jurisdiction or, a law, or somebody who does only criminal and I'm doing only civil, I haven't seen the person perform. How can I uh, uh, vote or not, uh, blackball, uh, not blackball, vote or vote for or against that particular candidate? I would need some solid input, which should not be only personal to me. And that is why it would become more objective. So that objectivity should not be compromised in the appointment of uh, seniors. That's my call. So uh, you also propose a role of a consultee judge in the... Kind of. I think it would help in that sense. A jurisdictional specialist who's seen the particular person argue right. who could be better than that. Justice Kohli, our constitution speaks of being a socialist, democratic, um, secular, republic country. And now the thing is that um, how do you view, uh, uh, you know, judges uh, participating in religious functions in the public domain is my first limb of the question. And my second limb of the question is, what is your take on, on the mingling of the executive and the judiciary in such platforms? I'll speak for myself. The question is directed towards me. S strictly speaking, judges shouldn't wear religiosity in public domains on their sleeves. Religiosity or religion or faith. And I think faith and spirituality are very different from religion. One must draw the distinction between the two. You could be an agnostic, you could still be a, and you have to be a, you need not be religious and still have faith in human mankind and what are the tenets that all religions teach us. I have, uh, I firmly believe that we should not carry that into public domain, it's too private. It should remain within me and my four walls and to my mind, it is very important that when we are brought up and brought into the system, it is humanity, it is our constitution, which I always say is our religion, 
nothing beyond constitution. So a sovereign socialist democratic society, what we talk of secular sovereign socialist democratic rep republic means that everything that is in public domain must be accepted by various classes of people and they sh should not have any such impression that the personal uh, leanings of a judge would interfere in dispensation of justice. That is critical to my mind and when there are public spaces where the judiciary and the executive interacts and uh, to my mind Devayan that has to happen because we are part of the same system. We have to meet the executive very often merely to carry forward the agenda of the judiciary of having more courts, more infrastructure, more human resources and so many other things that comes from them. So you can't just uh, live in an isolated uh, tower. It's not possible. There has to be an interface otherwise the system will suffer. The institution has to handle plenty things with the executive. But when it comes to such fora, coming in a public space maybe and meeting on any kind of an occasion like this, I see, I don't see anything wrong with it because everybody else is around you. You are just meeting in a public space. Maybe on an occasion you bump into somebody, that's okay in routine. But uh, I have never, speaking for myself, in my private domain permitted any such entry into uh, or an occasion for anybody to enter who is not part of my immediate core family because that is completely between me and my God. Wonderful. Have you as a judge, Justice Kohli, ever felt any pressure uh, from the executive while performing your duty? And have you come across any such experiences by any other judge? Of course, we, we should, we, you should not name them, but... Any well, answer. speaking for myself, and Devayan is being very courteous and not saying that I have been a tough judge which is thrown at me very often. Mm, I am uh, known to be one who does not uh, fall in line if there were lines to be drawn in any such box, fit into a box. I do not and I have never had an occasion of anybody having the gumption to come up to me and, uh, and try to influence me. And, uh, a couple of times when litigants, I am not talking of political pressure, when litigants try to reach out to you through somebody. I have um, not only made sure that I, re I recuse from the matter, but I'm, I've also made sure that it comes on the record, so that it, it is known that the litigant tried to reach out to you or do something which was not accepted. There is no reason for anybody to reach out to me on a personal level for a matter which is in the court, because we, are, we can't permit it. That's one part, that you should not permit it and you should not do it. I have come across a couple of times in the High Court, some, somebody or some colleague or the other, who seemed to be, because we don't talk work when we are outside of our court. It's uh, very clearly line drawn. When we meet outside the court, maybe over lunch or tea, we don't discuss matters inside of our court because that's entirely between me or my bench partner and the uh, and not nobody else's business. That includes maybe even the Chief Justice because he's one among several, uh, he or she. She need not be part of party to that. If there are some pressures which you can kind of gauge from somebody's uh, approach to things, uh, unless a person asks you, you can't tell him or her which way to go. It is uh, it is for that particular judge to be able to live by his or her own uh, leanings and thoughts. And uh, when I say leanings and thoughts, I don't mean on the personal front, I mean within the four corners of right. law. Therefore, speaking for myself, no, there's never been any pressure and thank the Lord for that. I would never have uh, taken it um, or accepted any such thing. But maybe sometimes at some courts in the, low, in the um, lower courts, it could be the uh, youngsters sometimes get a bit overwrought when they come into the judiciary, they learn the hard way, but then they grow with it and they're able to resist it and they're able to deal with it. And if we were all not able to do it, then the whole system would have collapsed, wouldn't it? The very fact that we are thriving, we are surviving and happily so as a uh, democracy shows that the systems are in place. Aberrations happen, but then they are exceptions to the rule, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, Justice Kohli, we have seen scores of cases in which, um, in fact, the courts have also pulled up the government for not being cooperative. Um, case in point was also Justice Calls, uh, you know, when he was dealing with the Collegium Appointments case. Yes. 
and he was at his wit's end um, over the center's delay in processing some of the names. Uh, in fact, I, I was personally covering the case. There were about eight to nine hearings when Justice Call had to remind the executive of clearing the names and, you know, the yes. dates were given right. and adjournments were sought. What do the court uh, or, or, or how should the court act in such a scenario? Um, it's an ongoing process, you know that. Even now, Honorable the CGI is handling that matter and some of these matters where names are stuck. So, um, important to keep the, the conversation going, very important. Um, instead of just brushing it under the carpet, which is, happens when you're having an open court hearing. It is, uh, there, has, there have to be answers coming from the center. If there is resistance, they have to give reasons for the resistance. Many, uh, and they do it. It's not as if they don't. But they do. Sometimes there is a little resistance to putting it in public domain. Um, that has to be dealt with by the bench. Uh, it's important to uh, have m some collaboration, but some resistance, because as I said, it's never a cozy relationship between the um, uh, judiciary and the legislature, and it can never be, and it should never be. So that kind of an abrasion, some kind of rough ends that need to be smoothened and fined, have to go on. It's an ongoing process. It needs to be dealt with time to time, spot to spot, and an onward journey so that one can push the names as much and as quickly as you can because there are deadlines for some judges right. who are bound to demit office and by, th by the time it's cleared, sometimes it's a dead cause. That should be resisted, certainly. Um, Justice Kohli, one of your most important judgments was also the fact that, you know, you had directed uh, a nationwide uh, practice um, that, you know, you cannot mention the caste, etc. in the court before all yes. case details, etc. of the litigants. Um, why do you think it was the need of the hour and how shocked were you when you found this out? It in one word, like, in no. one word, utterly, utterly shocked. Couldn't imagine that in an affidavit or a memo of party filed in the court of law, one needs to know more than the name and the address or the occupation of a litigant. It can never be accepted that castes, communities, religion, etc. should be form of any kind of document of this nature, which is filed in the court of law. It was surprisingly happening without exception. When I checked with the registry in the Supreme Court and the lawyers, particularly the ORs who had filed it, they said the norm is that whatever is filed in the courts below has to be replicated without any uh, deletion and they had no option in the matter and that is why our bench decided that the order has to go right down to the last court in the land that starting from the district courts that there is uh, absolutely no requirement of mentioning the caste, religion or any such personal detail of a litigant and then bring it upwards and wherever there is it should be deleted. Then when we talk of a secular country and we are talking of a set of litigants what would be the reason for the court to know the name or the, the community or the religion to which the litigant belongs? It is not any way in the domain of a court. We are only looking at a matter and its nuances and the law that is to be applied to it and no more. So it was imperative for a message to go that caste, community, religious lines have no place in the court of law. Right. While calling for minimal interference in arbitration by previous judgments, um, the Supreme Court has often held so. Yeah. Um, it recently set aside an arbitral award in the curative stage. Firstly, what kind of signal does it send? And secondly, um, how does it hold India back from, uh, you know, championing the, you know, to become the Indian international hub? So, um, well, this case was thrown at me because when recently in June, there was this London International Dispute Week where I had uh, gone and had some speaking assignments on the side. There were these very, very pointed questions that came from people in that particular country and those who had come from several parts as to why did we go that way. Fortunately, um, that was a saving grace that it was a domestic arbitration and it did not have international ramifications in that sense. It was confined to the parties within the domestic format um, and uh, therefore their anxiety that it could translate into something which was an international award which had other ramifications involved, was assuaged. Uh, that part was difficult for me to negotiate, shall I say that. Um, what weighed with the bench, of course, is a matter of public domain, but uh, some damage control had 
has to be done to, to undo that impression on the international platform in, in the sense of assuring them that courts in our country respect awards and ordinarily do not interfere in them and, and knowing that it is a forum of choice by, of the parties that it is not the job of the court to voice its own view on that and let the parties take a call once they've gone to an arbitrator unless as I said there are exceptions which are carved out in the statute. Right. How do you think the imminent entry of UK firms and lawyers in the Indian scenario will affect the dispute resolution system in India? I think we'll get a better international flavor which is goes to say that we would also we as an Indian legal community will gain. Uh, there are norms that the Bar Council has now set up and come up with diluted some needs to dilute more. Uh, it's a way forward. We are now living in a global village. We can't cut ourselves away beyond a point. The fear and the apprehension in the minds of the lawyers or the law firms that their works, work will be completely taken over, there has to be a balance between both. But the, at the same time, the professionalism that comes in would probably give us a boost and an impetus to improve ourselves as uh, lawyers, as um, uh, in law firms, and uh, maybe uh, cut the rough edges and make us sharper, more professional in dealing with matters, I think it would be for the better for both. There should be an exchange in the sense that the Indian lawyers should also have an equal opportunity to blossom. And th those kind of things, the bar councils or the law societies of other um, jurisdictions need to work on. But to my mind, it's a step in the right direction. We can't be cloistered forever. So there is nothing to be get we need to be threatened off or something? Uh, no, we need to deal with it and explain because the worst is that you don't know what you're dealing with. If you don't know, then the apprehension will always remain. Right. So you can't be what in pure Hindi, uh, the term is koop manduk, a uh, frog in the well. You can't be that. You have to go and jump into the mainstream and make a mark for yourself and make a place for yourself. So we have those stalwarts who are just a handful in our legal profession. We need a whole lot of them to mainstream and come up and be seen and be visible on international platforms. That will happen over a time. There are a few hiccups, but where is there no hiccups? There have to be hiccups for us to work. So work in progress is always better than no work. You said at a conference few, a few years ago that it's a lonely life as a judge. And if I may quote you, it is like goldfish in a bowl. Yep. Um, could you elaborate on that? Um, is a part of you really happy that it's over? <laughs> Firstly, I'm grateful for having uh, traversed the whole path. It was a great learning experience. I'm not complaining when I said that it is, a, I was stating a fact. I can't complain because I chose it and I went that way because I wanted to. So why should I complain? Uh, the only thing is that somebody who comes into that system should know that if you're a pure people's person, you can't uh, survive unless you're very strong mentally you have a lot of resilience, you have a lot of core family backup. It's a lonely existence in that sense. Because as I said, we are people's persons as lawyers. We, we meet everybody freely. There are no barriers. So you don't need to think twice on why A or B or C is coming over to meet you. You know that it could be just a general conversation. When you become a judge, you have to step back from all of it because you're wearing a mantle of somebody who should be seen and perceived to be uninfluenced by people around you right. and that uh, being uninfluenced means stepping back from mainstreaming from others who you don't know may end up in your court tomorrow as a litigant. So you can't open yourself out that much. You must know where to draw the line. At the same time, um, I would from my experience in Delhi High Court say that it is not as if judges lead a completely secluded life. Wherever there are, um, uh, we overlap as in functions where we meet lawyers, as in uh, many times some uh, deaths, some marriages, some social functions which you attend, that doesn't compromise a judge. I'm very clear in my mind about it. How can it compromise you? You need to be strong enough to know that you, know you're, you have that confidence to deal with situations when you're in court, uninfluenced by who stands in front of you. And if you don't have that confidence, who will infuse it in you? So you should be strong and determined to lead that life and accept it as part of the system. So if you live like a fish in a gold, uh, in, a, in a bowl, well, you have accepted it and you want to live that life. But you should be ready to accept it. Unfortunately, the family doesn't have a choice, but they also have to accept it. That is a fallout because when they are attached to you, 
then what people look at them or people try to reach out to you through them, they also have to be equally cautious yeah. that they build that wall around you and keep you protected from all those kind of elements who need not come in immediate contact with you. So the family has an equal responsibility to discharge towards the person who was dispensing justice, which we tend to forget. Just as you were speaking that, you know, uh, being a people's person, it might be difficult for them. But also, let's not forget the role of social media now. A lot of senior lawyers are on Twitter, are on Instagram. Absolutely. So once they are designated, yes. maybe in the future, it's right. going to be very tough for them to live go, down. Yeah, to, you know, to let that go. And Yes, uh, because it's going to be thrown at them at, at some stage yes. or the other. And yes. sometimes some names have also been uh, uh, considered for judgeship and question marks have been raised because they have Associate given a, post yes, five years they have now. given a view. Uh, well, we, we are all evolving, aren't we, all the time, Divine, as we, every day is a learning experience, so all these years as just... But by and large, yeah, one must remember that if it is a lower political meaning and it can influence the person as a judge in a matter before him or her, then one must be cautious because end of the day, the neutrality is the first requirement of a judge. Objectivity and neutrality being compromised at any stage affects the judgment. This brings us to the end of the interview. Um, yes. Mrs. Kohli, this is one question that I ask all the judges. Yes. Any post-retirement opportunities? Nothing has come my way as of now. Uh, it ha if, if, if something would, maybe I'd think about it. If, it is, if I think I'm able to really, really contribute to it in some way, um, I'm happy to say that uh, having stepped out, and it's now what, literally two weeks uh, of uh, uh, laying down office, uh, it's nice to uh, be um, uh, reached out to by lawyers and others for arbitrations and opinions that have started coming my way. It's a trickle, but it feels that you, you have a role to play and you remain relevant in a system. But you are open to it. Of I would be open only if there would be something very special that would come my way. I'm not hankering for anything at this point. Nobody has reached out to me as of now. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Kohli, for being with us. Thank you, Devai. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.